Good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Jolla Community Church. Let's worship.
are beautiful Your face is all I see And when your eyes are on this child Your grace abounds to me Deneen, thank you so much. Christopher, thank you. Craig, thank you. Uh, isn't it great having Deneen come to your house on Sunday and sing to you? Uh, we can arrange for that every week, I hope. Uh, that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> you can all say, you can tell all your friends and family, you know who's at my house this morning singing to me? <laughs> your own personal uh, worship service. It's a Sabbath. I hope you're enjoying a Sabbath rest. Uh, the beaches are. <laughs> uh, Everybody seems to be in a lockdown mode, but let's look at it today as, as a Sabbath rest mode, okay? Uh, and let me ask you this question. Uh, as you shelter in place, are you thinking like a dog or a cat? Uh, are you thinking like a dog or a cat? Now, if you have a dog, I want you to look at your dog and, and look at your dog. Your dog is looking at you so happy to be in your presence. You can do nothing wrong. Uh, you are the VIP, MVP of, of your domain uh, in the eyes of your dog. I want you to look over at your cat, if you can find your cat. Uh, if, you, if you can see your cat, probably your cat's not looking at you. Uh, don't take it personally, it's just the way it is. In fact, I want to give you some insight into how your dog and your cat might be experiencing this time. Uh, your dog is, is, is looking at it this way. We're all together! I love this! This is the best day ever. That's your dog. 
And you know your dog, so you know that's how your dog is thinking. And your dog is probably smiling at you, nodding uh, his or her head, saying, of course, why wouldn't I? I feel that way. Uh, your cat, though, on the other hand, is saying this, 14th day of captivity, caged in this house of horror. When, when will it end? I'm sorry, but that's how your cat's thinking right now. Uh, but because your dog is thinking the way your dog's thinking and your cat is the <laughs> thinking the way your cat is thinking, uh, you don't have to worry about either one because you get to think like you think. Uh, of course, we get to think like people uh, created in God's image, uh, created to reflect His goodness, His glory, uh, to celebrate His presence in our lives. So what's in your head today that helps you do that? What's in your heart today that helps you do that? What's in your hands today that would help you recognize the glory and the goodness of God and celebrate Him. Uh, how can you make life better and more bearable for everyone around you? Uh, that's the question I want to start with in addition to saying, you know, how are you experiencing uh, this time? Uh, how can you make life better and more bearable for everybody around you? Some good news, uh, commutes are now shorter, <laughs> road rage is way down, uh, nobody has to go to traffic school. You can actually do it from home. So that's, that's good news. Meanwhile, we're keenly aware of what we're missing and, and losing uh, out on it at this time. Uh, my heart goes out to seniors in, in high school and college wondering, am I going to get to graduate? Yeah, maybe I'll graduate, but no ceremony probably. It'll be a smaller party. Uh, but you know what? In the midst of that, you're going to be able to celebrate the goodness of this big moment for you, this big transition from one season of life to the next. Uh, shout out to uh, Lieutenant Commander Jeff Shepard, who on Friday uh, retired after 20 years serving in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer. Uh, we, there was going to be a big party, a big celebration, and it was a very quiet ceremony. Powerful and meaningful, uh, moving nonetheless. Uh, but there's some things we're, we're not going to get to do in the way that we wanted to do them. But we can still find the goodness in them. Uh, lots of things are being postponed. Lots of things are being moved around. Lots of things are up in the air. Uh, there's some, some hard things that people are experiencing right now, as you know. You might be one of them. You might be going through a hard experience. And it's easy to say, well, mine are first world experiences. Yes, but nonetheless, there's a sense of grief and loss over what you're going through. And yet as we step back from it, we realize there's a million people on the border of Turkey looking for a better life. Refugees, freezing, it's cold. It's the end of winter, spring is here, it's not there. So as we put that in perspective, we realize there's a lot of things uh, that people are missing and losing out on. What can we do to make life better and more bearable for people immediately around us and, and way beyond where we are? So everyone you know is stressed right now. Uh, dealing with this disruption. Everybody you know is stressed right now. Stress is more contagious than the coronavirus. Why? Because everyone gets stressed. Little kids feel stressed. Teenagers, young adults feel stressed. Older people, very stressed. Uh, you might be feeling stressed for one reason or another right now, or you're close to people who are stressed. So that's unanimous, 100%. All of us are infected uh, with stress, which is so deadly and contagious. So how do we choose to respond to stress? How we choose to respond to stress really, really matters. And it becomes an issue of context. Have we seen things from the largest, best perspective possible? Uh, let me frame it this way for you. We're in an Emmaus Road moment. An Emmaus Road moment. You might not remember that name, Emmaus Road. But following Jesus' resurrection, before they knew that he'd really risen from the dead, they, before they'd confirmed it, but there were, there were rumors that he somehow, had, after this horrible crucifixion, uh, his body was now gone, stolen, removed. What happened? And so it was a complete disruptive moment for all those people whose hopes were on Jesus uh, to be the Savior of Israel, the Savior of humankind. And so Luke uh, 24, in, in that wonderful passage, having described the disruption and the disarray, the discouragement, the despondency, uh, in that passage, Dr. Luke describes two people walking on the road to Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they're walking along despondently, very, very discouraged, a person that comes alongside them, they don't recognize the person, and of course we know it's Jesus. And he says, what's going on? 
And they said, don't, don't you know? Are you the only person who doesn't know what's been going on here? Life is upside down. Life that we had hoped for has been crushed, broken, littered on the ground as so much debris. And he said, well, tell me what's going on. And, and they, they did. And then he said to them, let me tell you. Let me tell you what's going on. And of course, he tells them all that had to happen, all the larger context of what they were going through and what was yet to come. And they, they summarized it this way. The two people said, they asked each other, and this is Luke 24, 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? One minute our hair was on fire, the next minute our hearts are on fire. What changed? What changed? Well, I'll tell you what changed. Same facts, bigger truth. The truth. The truth in person, up close and personal. Disorder and confusion reframed in the presence of Jesus. Put that in perspective as you think about this time that you're in, that we're in as a community, and that we're in as a country, that we are in as a world. So second point, if the first was a question, how, how are you doing uh, as you shelter in place? Uh, this is a corona alert, and, and by that I don't mean the virus. The virus gets no attention uh, from us today. It's a context, but it's a small context. The corona I'm talking about is the crown that our king wears. Uh, the one who revealed himself on the road to Emmaus wants to reveal himself to you as the king today, tomorrow, this week, in the months uh, and years to come. Corona alert, don't waste this crisis by shutting down in it. Don't throw yourself a pity party. Don't look for people to blame. Don't project your frustrations on the people around you. Don't deny what you're going through. Don't waste this crisis. Let God meet you in the midst of it. Let God speak to you in the midst of it. Let God open your mind and your heart to the possibilities, to the opportunities. Walk with Jesus and discover something to celebrate. <laughs> now, that might be so counterintuitive right now. It might, might sound implausible. It might sound foolish. Does that sound naive and unrealistic and overly optimistic to you? Uh, does it sound too Pollyanna to you? Uh, are you familiar with Pollyanna? Uh, a whole generation of people are familiar with Pollyanna. A whole generation of people are not familiar with Pollyanna. Uh, don't underestimate her. Uh, she was a young girl who looked for the good in life and found it. Uh, Pollyanna emerged in our culture uh, in 1910 as a, as a story. Uh, within a decade, a movie was made about it, very inspiring. In 1960, uh, Disney made a movie called Pollyanna. And since that time, uh, <laughs> uh, she has become shorthand for looking at life in a naively positive way. And so just recently I heard somebody say, I don't want to be all Pollyanna about it, but I see it referenced in the newspaper. And it's a way of saying, don't be naive. I don't want to be naive, but I'm seeing some hope here. And we almost have to excuse ourselves, ask, ask for forgiveness, qualify that we're seeing something hopeful in otherwise a really tough situation. It sounds like we're not taking it seriously enough. I hope you watch Pollyanna with your kids. I hope you watch it as a family. Uh, it's an easy movie to mock if you're a cynic at heart. Easy to mock. But I watched it this week with Janet, and it still moves me. I couldn't tell if Janet was crying or not, but my eyes were kind of cloudy, so I really couldn't see very well. <laughs> it moved me watching this movie that I saw as a little kid and watching it again and, and realizing, wow, it's, it's tempting to mock this, but really what I want to do is appreciate this. A young girl who looks for the good and finds it. And in doing that, she is this redemptive presence in her community. Now, I should give you a context. She's an orphan. Her parents are missionaries. She's looking at the world upside down and backwards at this point, and yet she still looks for the goodness in it. Powerful, powerful. So we're not talking about denial. We're talking about celebrating something. Celebrating goodness in the face of adversity is essential to our well-being. If you can't learn to celebrate goodness in the face of adversity, you will, you will not flourish and you will not thrive. You'll be postponing. Just like you feel like your life is being postponed right now and put on hold, 
If you fail to celebrate the goodness of God in the midst of adversity, you are postponing your life. You're putting it on hold. You're robbing yourself of a larger, necessary, essential context and perspective that the Lord himself wants to give us through his word, through his spirit, through his people. Otherwise, we let evil set the norm. We let life's disappointments and discouragements set the norm. And we get forced into serving those, those disappointments, those, those evil uh, moments. We don't want to be a part of that, but somehow we're forced to make it the main thing in our life. It does not deserve to be the main thing in our life, though it's a factor in our life. Why? Because goodness rules. God rules, and the goodness of God rules. You might not know the name, uh, but I love this name. Rubino Romeo Salmoni. Uh, he lived to be 91 years old. Rubino Romeo Salmoni. A happy-go-lucky guy at age 24 was sent to a concentration camp because he was an Italian Jew. He survived Auschwitz. Survived it, married, celebrated 50 years of marriage, had wonderful kids and 12 grandchildren. And he liked to say, I ruined Hitler's plan for my life. And he wrote a book, a wonderful book, called, In the End, I Beat Hitler. It became the basis for a book, uh, a screenplay, a movie that perhaps you've seen uh, called um, Life is Beautiful, uh, written and produced, directed, starred in by Roberto Benigni, another Italian Jew. If you've seen the movie, it's, it's powerful. It's a parable of how to look for goodness in the midst of evil. Now, some have criticized it and said, oh, it's kind of unrealistic. Uh, actually, it's powerfully realistic in the power for him to capture the imagination of his young son who's in a prisoner of war camp, a, a horrible, horrible concentration camp during World War II. Uh, I, I recommend that movie to you as well. So Pollyanna and, and Life is Beautiful. When we celebrate, when we celebrate, when we celebrate, we capture a larger reality. Isn't that what we want to do? Don't we want to offer a larger, a better reality? Not denial, not pretending things aren't hard. Not, not, not pretending that things couldn't be better, but capturing the goodness of God right with us now. Why do we celebrate? We find happiness in experiencing goodness. We don't just celebrate because we're happy. We think, well, I'm celebrating because I'm really happy. Fist bumps, you know, cheers, trophies, banquets. Really what we're recognizing deeply is something good is going on something that we've gotten to be a part of, that we want to celebrate and, and see. Because sometimes goodness, there's big gaps in life between the goodness we see and experience, partly because we're not paying attention. But when it's big and good, we want to say, oh, I want to capture this moment. And so we celebrate our gratitude uh, to God for relationships and moments that bless us. When we celebrate something, we honor life as a gift from God, little or big. So let me ask you this. Uh, what do you celebrate? Just do a quick mental inventory. What do you celebrate? How about this? When do you celebrate? And finally, uh, how do you celebrate? What, what ways do you celebrate? I'll, I'll throw out some ideas. Uh, what and when? Uh, celebrate people, occasions, memories, answered prayer, beauty, and grace. All worthy of being celebrated. And then celebrate with words, with food, with awards, with gifts, with toasts, with stories, with prayers. Yes, even tears of joy. Now I want to ask you a personal question, and because you're home with maybe just one or two other people with you, uh, you don't have to be self-conscious answering this. How many of you have ever celebrated with tears of joy? Have you ever been moved by tears of joy? Uh, this summer we, we uh, had a big party out, out on the lawn and showed a movie, and the movie was called Ugly Doll. That's a whole other story. Why would somebody call a movie that, make a movie like that, or watch a movie like that? But it's a, it was a fantastic movie. And after the movie, a, a young boy was walking by one of our staff, and our, our staff noticed that the little boy was, was, had tears in his eyes, and, and the staff person said, are you okay? How did how, you like the movie? And the kid said, good, fine, and kept walking. But then stopped, and in a, in a wonderful way, not defiantly, but in a wonderful way to say, I'm going to own this moment. He said, these, this kid's about six or seven, these are tears of joy. <laughs> what a great moment. That was a moment of celebration, a spontaneous declaration of celebration. 
I am so thankful. I saw a movie that filled me with so much joy that it caused tears. That I was so moved deeply with a message of hope and unconditional love. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Whenever we celebrate, we recognize our blessings, small and large. And small people and large people all can celebrate the goodness of these blessings. Sometimes we quietly celebrate the significance of small graces, little things, a little momentary recognition of celebration. Nothing big. Maybe nobody would notice, but we're saying, yeah, it's good. Or if you're with somebody else, you just look at each other and go, yeah, that was good. We loudly celebrate the significance of big moments and big markers, weddings, funerals, graduations, big achievements, big accomplishments, deliverance from something that was overwhelming we thought would take us out. So celebration is expressing praise, gratitude, and love with others. That's what the psalmist tells us. Psalm 52.9, the psalmist is talking to God saying, For what you have done, for what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. So celebration is expressing praise, gratitude, and love internally, certainly, but with other people. That's when the celebration really starts to, to, to uh, connect in a community and make a community. Celebration not only celebrates community, a symbol of great community, but it also creates community. It gives us a reason to bond together. Suffering does that too. In fact, right now, we're, we're, a lot of us are being tied together through our either mutual suffering and sacrifice or observation of those going through suffering and sacrifice. It ties us together. All of a sudden, we're all about first responders. All of a sudden, the checkout people at Vons are heroes, right? The delivery person. Uh, we're celebrating that, and it's creating a community sense, even though we're isolated from each other temporarily. But then celebration also is, is gratitude for the gift and the giver. That's what the psalmist says, what you have done. I want to uh, read you a, a, a brief passage from Luke 17. Jesus is going from the north of Israel, Galilee, to the south. He has to go through an area that's mountainous, so he's coming up out of Galilee into these foothills called Samaria. And it's sort of a, a no-go place uh, for the Jews in that day. But Jesus, uh, there are Jewish towns there, and Jesus is walking through that because it's the shortest way from Galilee up to higher up to Jerusalem. And so uh, Luke tells us, it happened that as Jesus made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance. Hey, I've seen that. I know what that's about. They kept their distance, but raised their voices. Ooh, that's a good, that's a good clue. Keep your distance, but raise your voice. Reach out. Let people know what you're experiencing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you need, what you hope for. Calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This is a great collective prayer at this time for all of us, isn't it? Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And, and Jesus stops and says he took a good look at them. Taking a good look at them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. Because if you had leprosy, you had to be separate from everybody. You were in constant, forever, perpetual, permanent isolation. But if somehow you overcame the leprosy, you were healed, you got better somehow. Not very many people did. It was a life sentence, and it didn't end well. But if for some reason you, you were able to dodge that bullet, you could go to the priest, and the priest would look at you and examine you and say, okay, you're clean. You can re-enter a community. So go, he says to them, show yourselves to the priest. They went and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude. This is a one-man celebration. Shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful. He couldn't thank him enough. And then Luke notes this, and he was a Samaritan. This is a little observation on the part of Luke recording what Jesus was doing. He was speaking to the Jews first and primarily, that through the Jews the nations would be blessed. And out of these ten people, apparently nine of them were Jews and one was a Samaritan. This is not a, a put down on Jews, it's just saying they, these, the, 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 at the time the people were not seeing, they were not seeing the goodness of God and the gratitude of, of, toward God. But the Samaritan, 
the lowest and the least in that world was so grateful. He was glorifying God, falls on his knees to thank God. Jesus said, we're not ten healed. Where are the nine? Wow. Ten people blessed, only one aware enough to celebrate the blessing, to recognize the goodness of God in their life. So Jesus said, can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, get up on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. There's something redemptive and transformational about celebrating the goodness of God. Let that sink in. Nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can isolate you from that. No one can deprive you of that. You don't have to ask anybody's permission to do that. It's unauthorized and indiscriminate. You can do it whenever, wherever you want. You can do it internally, you can do it externally. You can do it on your own, you can include others. It's powerful. God has given you a powerful, powerful tool. Probably the best arrow in your quiver is, is gratitude, thanksgiving, at glorifying God that represents celebrating the life and the goodness he's given you in the midst of the life that you wish you already had. You're probably familiar with the five love languages. Uh, they describe some pathways for celebrating. Affirming words, acts of service, gifts, quality time, physical touch. Uh, my love language is affirming words, acts of service, gifts, quality time, physical touch. I want it all. Uh, I'm multilingual. Those, those are my love languages. But actually, all of us have all of them, but we all have one primary one. I want to ask you, what is your primary love language? Which, which way that people love you makes the biggest impact on you? Here's why it matters. Uh, it's going to help you celebrate the people around you and celebrate life together. When you know that this is what really is important to this child, to this, this, this young person, to this, this spouse, parent, friend, uh, to this older person in your life, to a neighbor. If you know that affirming words don't really go very far, but, but physical touch is powerful, a hug, that an act of service, can I, can I help you? What do you need? See, celebrating something every day redeems it. It redeems us. Today is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is celebrate every day until further notice. So recognizing the, this love language, arsenal, uh, quiver that we have, this toolkit we have, it allows us to say, I, how can I celebrate life in and with uh, my family and beyond my family in that network of people I know, people I don't even know, but I have contact with? And since you might not know the person at the checkout stand of Ons, you can simply say, thanks so much. Uh, if there's somebody in your, in, in your world that is doing something that is, is way beyond the call of duty, a little gift, a gesture would go a long way. Even if it's not their main love language, they'll give you full credit for it in the sense that they'll say, thank you, I appreciate your, your gesture. See, love isn't just big plays, big, big moments when we give the big gift, we have the big event. Love is a series of small gestures that we get to celebrate. If we don't celebrate the small gestures, when we get to the big gestures, they're going to feel a bit empty. It's those small gestures along the way that, 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 that uh, cumulatively allow us to really enjoy the big moments. And so whenever we celebrate, we invoke hope, a yearning for the world we're made for. It reminds us to whom we really belong, where we're really going. And so we live in hope, and whenever we celebrate, we celebrate hope. That's why Paul, the apostle, writing to the people in Philippi, says this, I press on toward the upward call of God in Christ. This is Philippians 3.14. I press on. I keep moving. I keep moving toward the Lord. I keep moving toward the goodness. I keep celebrating the progress I'm making as I'm moving through life with him. And so our hope in Christ allows us to persist and press on toward him, the giver of every good and perfect gift, the source of our joy, the source of our salvation, uh, the, the, sor the source of our humanity. And so uh, look up within and around you as you move through life. Take a 360 3D view of life. Look in you. Look around you. Be completely aware and conscious of the goodness that God is making available to you in so many ways that you might not otherwise pay attention and see. Overwhelmed as we are by all the things petty and big uh, that afflict us, that assault us, uh, that bum us out. Uh, Israel, 
uh, sang celebrative songs of ascent as they climbed up toward Jerusalem. Every year, people would go to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And on the way up, uh, there were, there were uh, 15 psalms, 120 to 134, that they would sing together and to each other. Uh, and so their destination was Jerusalem, but they celebrated all the way up to Jerusalem. The big destination where they were really going to celebrate was the temple in Jerusalem, but all the way up, they were celebrating. They were internalizing the presence of God as they went up to worship him in the temple. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We're going somewhere really, really good, but we need to celebrate all the way. So, so here's the third and big, last big part of this uh, notion of celebrating something. If we want to live for today and prepare for tomorrow. That describes us, doesn't it? In Christ, we're going somewhere good. We're celebrating all the way. We're celebrating all the way. I love the, the, the phrase uh, every year during Passover. Wherever people are celebrating Passover, that Seder dinner. Uh, Seder means order. They're putting their world in order by celebrating the Passover meal. That we've been redeemed by a loving God. They, they always say during that meal, if they're not in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem. We're celebrating now. He's with us now, but next year it'll be even more special in Jerusalem. You see where that is? For us, we're celebrating him now and someday in his presence. I, I, I heard several in the news uh, media people talk about uh, the coronavirus event as a morbidity event, which made me chuckle. I'm thinking, life is a morbidity event. <laughs> we don't know how long we have to live. It's a morbidity event. But in the midst of, of knowing that someday we will die, we know right now we live. And yet, though we die, yet shall we live. And nothing and no one can take away that, uh, take that away from us. That's why we celebrate it. So whether, um, uh, so let me put it this way. We, we believe that going is as important as the getting there. We're on our way somewhere good. We bring goodness with us wherever we go. We bring the goodness with us. We recognize the goodness around us. So whether in the pit or in a palace, we're always in the presence of our king. That's why every worship service is a corona event. We worship the one who wears the crown. Wherever he sits is the head of the table. So whether in the valley, the desert, the wilderness, we're looking up to him. In weariness and success and sickness and health, we're looking up to him. Are you looking up to him? We press on and persist in his goodness, guided by his Holy Spirit, his word, in the company of his people. Have you noticed how many people you've talked to or been touched or texted or, or emailed by this week? There's probably more community in your life right now than normal because they're all around you normally, normally, but we're not necessarily paying attention to them. We don't feel the urgency to reach out or to respond, and all of a sudden now we do. It's a powerful moment. Don't waste the crisis, right? God's goodness calls us upward for a better view of him, a better view of ourselves, a better view of others. People made in the image of God, deserving of his love and goodness. People who celebrate God's goodness are resilient and resourceful in adversity. You want to be resilient and resourceful in the face of this adversity? You be a person who celebrates God's goodness. Don't be hokey about it. You don't have to call a lot of attention to yourself. Or make a big play about how, how, how you know, you're, you're doing what you do. You can do it in ways that are very quiet, very subtle. But the effect will be powerful. It'll make a difference. See, people who celebrate God's goodness and become resilient and resourceful see an opportunity in everything. They look for God at work everywhere. People who create goodness are like rivers in the desert, they're like, they're like food trucks in a food desert. Uh, they bring resource and refreshment, nourishment wherever they go. They're looking for something to celebrate and creating reasons to celebrate. Uh, you know what we call people like that? We call them crazy. They're crazy people. Why are they crazy people? Because they're crazy in love. You know how it is when you feel absolutely obsessed with something that you love, someone that you love, you're crazy. You rearrange your life. All of a sudden you have time you didn't know you had. You had energy you didn't know you had. You, you have resources you didn't know you had. You could suffer in ways you didn't know you were capable of. You can sacrifice in ways that make you feel more alive. Crazy, isn't it? Yes, crazy in love. These people celebrate life every day with all their heart, all their soul, 
or their mind or their strength. I want to call out some names right now. And I, and I want you, uh, wherever you are, uh, uh, to, to call to mind names of people who bring God's goodness to you, who make life for you good. Now, if you're with other people, call out those names. If you're on your own, and don't feel self-conscious. Hey, call out the names. I'm going to be calling out the names. You don't need to listen to me read them. Call out your own. Well, so, so simultaneously, spontaneously, everybody part of this worship service today will be calling out names of people who represent God's goodness to them. So I'm going to start calling out some names, and you call out some in your own world. Uh, Susie, Sean, Dan, Ryland, Mike, Bridget, Mary, Ryan, Barb, Bob, Dave, Yvonne, Tim, Janet, Lauren, Megan, Nick, JJ, Miles, Ed, Sue, Seal, Rick, Diane. Scott, Kathy, I could go on and on and on, so could you. These are the people that reflect God's goodness to me, make my life good and worth living. God's love makes us all crazy enough to give it to everybody always. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you a blessing, a benediction. Uh, And after that, I want you to turn to the people around you, if they're around you, and, and, and ask them, what is it that they'd like to celebrate today? If, there, if there's no one around you at the moment, text somebody, email somebody, call somebody, Skype somebody, FaceTime somebody, house party somebody, Zoom somebody, Google community somebody, and ask them what do they want to celebrate, what are they celebrating, and tell them what you want to celebrate and what you are celebrating. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've given us the capacity to experience your goodness, to see your goodness at work in the world, a world that is fallen and fallible and failing and flawed in so many ways, where viruses emerge, where people are struck down, deprived, where we feel crushed, and yet, Lord, you lift us up by your love and and the goodness of your resurrection power. So, Lord, I pray that I would have that kind of hope, that kind of resilience, uh, that kind of resourcefulness, because you are in me, that you are in anybody who calls on you and invites you into their life as their Lord, as their Savior. As we submit ourselves to you individually, collectively, as families, as networks of friends, as a community of faith in you, help us, Lord, to shine and reflect your light and your love in a community that so desperately needs it right now. Not with lectures on hand washing anymore. We know how to wash our hands. Not with lectures on keeping appropriate social distance. Help us, Lord, to bridge that gap of distance between us and you and us and other people in your name by expressing love and doing good in ways that we can, that we have at hand, that we have in our head, that we have in our heart. We pray this, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to offer you a benediction. The, the, the band is going to um, be uh, leading us in another song. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you at, at the end of all that to go to ljcc.org and do three things. Uh, you'll see when you open up the website, it'll, there's a red band And it says, click here, click on that. Uh, And that'll tell you about this movement we're trying to make. We want to contact everybody in our church, first of all, in the next couple of weeks. But also, we want to hear from everybody in our church. We want you to tell us your story. How's sheltering place going for you? So do a click here on that uh, that ribbon, that banner on the the opening of the website. Then look at that button that says care. Uh, Would you tell us how we can pray for you? We love praying for people throughout the week. And then uh, there's a button called give. Uh, Would you linger over that button uh, and consider making a contribution to allow us to keep doing what we do? Um, So that's that's our request of you. Tell us your story. Tell us how we can pray for you. Uh, Walk with us as we continue to uh, do what we believe is our mission in Jesus' name. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us all both now and forevermore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. While they're setting up, turn to each other, or think of people uh, that you want to tell uh, what you're celebrating, and you want to ask what they want to celebrate. God bless you.
Oh, your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in the darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend, oh yes And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good, yes With every breath that I am able I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God oh, oh, oh. Thank you Jesus Amen <laughs>